Hello and welcome to our talk today on GDPR. I'm Rosalind Price Cousins and I'm the Business Skills Coordinator here at the Crafts Council where we aim to support craft businesses. Today I have guest speaker Alex Wellham who is a solicitor at Ripper Legal and we have a long-standing relationship with Ripper as they support people from the creative industries and specialise in intellectual property or IP which is very important to makers. Um, the correct IP protection can help prevent people from stealing or copying your brand, your designs, all the things that you make. So before I hand over to Alex, just to outline the relevance of GDPR for your craft business. Um, GDPR stands for the General Data Protection Regulation, and it's there to ensure that the data that you gather is used fairly, lawfully and transparently. So essentially, it's about respecting other people's information, often by implementing policies and procedures to protect the data that's handled and stored by your craft business. So I'm going to hand over to Alex now to go through this in a bit more detail. And at the end, we'll go through some GDPR questions that we've received from various makers. And Alex will be answering these for us. So over to you, Alex. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rosalind. Thank you for the introduction. So welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to this short video introducing GDPR. Uh, my name is Alex. Uh, I work with Ripper Solicitors, uh, and we've been working in collaboration with Craft Council now for quite some time, much to the benefit of its members. So many of you who are joining us today are likely to have just started or thinking about starting a small business. Uh, and whilst GDPR can often be overlooked, it is important to consider. And, and whilst we do appreciate that it can often be a minefield to get your head around, we will do our best to keep this video short and sweet, to give you a quick overview, highlighting the key things to know and consider at this early stage in your business. So let's begin with what is GDPR? What's its purpose and why is it important? Well, the aims to bring about, the aims were to bring about wholesale change in the way that businesses handle personal data. Since the ascension of the Data Protection Act uh, in 1998, technology has changed infinitesimally. We are in the age of internet where information has become easily accessible and easily shareable. The monetization of data has seen the rise of billion dollar companies in such a small amount of time that the EU decided something had to be done to protect ordinary citizens from having their data exploited. To secure people's personal data and to combat this, the EU introduced guidelines on how to handle data, especially for companies which could share data and make a profit from it. GDPR came into force thanks to the updated Data Protection Act of 2018. However, following Brexit, the UK continued to adopt the EU GDPR with a copycat piece of legislation called the UK GDPR. For the purposes of this video, we'll just be referencing GDPR. And GDPR does apply to anyone who handles and stores personal data. So let's look at this in a bit more detail. So what are the principles behind GDPR? Well, there are seven key principles which together with their, their intention is to force businesses to carry out fair and proper use uh, of processing the processing of people's personal information. Those seven key principles are lawfulness, fairness and transparency, purpose limitation, data minimization, accuracy, storage limitation, integrity and confidentiality and accountability. So by now, I expect you're probably wondering, well, what is personal data? Now, as a business, you are privy to certain personal information of your customers. As a result, you are obliged to handle that data in accordance with the law. Personal data is any information which can identify a person. Relevant examples of such data can include your customer's name, their contact details, such as their telephone, telephone number, their email address, or their physical home address, payment details such as credit and debit cards, their IP address, and even a customer number. There are other types of personal data, for example, special categories of personal data that include things like medical records. However, for the purposes of this video, that is outside of the scope. The idea of personal data can be very broad. So it is important to keep safe any information the customer provides to you. Now, when we talk about GDPR, there are three key parties that are often talked about that you may have heard of. And those are a data controller, a data processor, and a data subject. So let's start with you, the data controller and processor. 
The data controller is a person or authority which determines what personal data needs to be collected, for what purpose, and means of processing. In other words, they decide what is done with the data. The processor has a similar role, except they exclusively process that data. They do not dictate what data is collected or for what purpose. Typically, a data processor is a person or an organization working on behalf of the controller, therefore under their influence. As a person or business selling goods or providing a service, you will most likely be the data controller. And as a data controller, you hold overall control of the personal data you collect and thus are ultimately responsible for its handling and safekeeping. This control should be exercised well while following the regulations of the Data Protection Act. If you are handling a lot of personal data, then you may wish to consider appointing a data protection officer, which we will consider briefly a little later on. The data subject is essentially your customer, the person whose personal data you will be collecting. Data subjects are the owner of the personal data you will be handling, and as such, under the GDPR, they are given certain rights over the way the data is handled, stored, and accessed. Some brief examples of this are subject access requests, or SARS. A data subject is entitled to, a com to confirmation on whether an organization is holding their data, what data is being held, and for what reasons. A data subject may also request a copy of the data you are holding on them, and this request typically has to be responded to within a month. In certain circumstances, a data subject has rights to ask for this data to be deleted. This can be done when the data is no longer necessary for its intended purpose. For example, where a customer orders something online and provides their address for delivery, once that order has been fulfilled, you no longer need to hold on to it. Therefore, upon request, it ought to be deleted. There are some exceptions to the erasure of data. These exceptions can include compliance with a legal requirement or reasons relating to public interest, scientific research, or defense of legal claims. And we won't go into more detail uh, of this in this video. However, ultimately, it is the role of the data controller to determine if exceptions apply. Now, as mentioned earlier, any business can appoint a data protection officer, also known as the DPO. A DPO does not need to be someone internal to your business or organization. You can appoint someone external. The important things to consider is that the person in question does have the relevant knowledge. Most small businesses, such as yourselves, will be exempt unless your business, business core activities involve regular or systematic monitoring of data subjects on a large scale but I think we can safely assume that won't be the case here. So let's move on. How do you handle personal data? Well, by now I expect you're wondering, what can I do in terms of processing this information? How do I store it? Well, when handling those data, the GDPR in theory allows a data owner to hold this information indefinitely. The GDPR does outline that you may hold this data for as long as you genuinely need it meaning at the point it is no longer necessary, you ought to delete it. Essentially, the length this data is held is up to you to determine within reason. As a guide to a timescale, many companies store this data for between 10 and 20 years after their last interaction with a customer. The data should be kept as securely as possible. The GDPR specifies how data needs to be stored. It mentions storage must be within the EU or a jurisdiction where a country outside the EU offers adequate protection. The UK currently does have adequacy protection status. This can be stored on a cloud-based software where the data is encrypted before it is published. When determining how to store the data, it is important to consider the security the service provides as to avoid a data breach. This data should go under regular review to check that the security and necessity of the information and to determine if you no longer need to store it. 
Now, data breaches have been something that have been in the news quite frequently in the last few years. The data breach is a breach in security that gives unauthorized people access to the, st to the stored data without your permission. This discloses personal data to third parties, something which really has to be avoided as best as possible. Steps should be taken to minimize these breaches, such as password protections and encryptions. Whilst breaches can be minimized, there is still a possibility that data can be made vulnerable. In the event of a breach, there are outlined steps which you must take in accordance with the GDPR. The moment that you find out about a data breach, the data controller, that is you, must be informed. You must notify the data subjects, depending on the type of data you are handling, but must be informed to the proper supervisory authority as soon as possible. This should include a report with the number of data subjects affected, the types of data subjects affected, for example, if you have separate storage methods for members and guests, and what has been done since the breach and any other information you have regarding the breach. Importantly, you must inform the data subject of the breach as it is in accordance with their rights to be informed about their data. This information should be communicated within 72 hours unless there is an extremely good reason not to notify the customer. For example, this may be where the relevant authority has prevented you from saying so, for instance, during an investigation into the breach. If a business or organization does not properly care and process an individual's data, they could be faced with a large fine. If there is a security breach, there could also be a fine. This is wholly dependent on your actions as the data controller and data processor. And the reasonable steps you take to protect your customer's information. The GDPR outlines that even smaller offenses can find themselves with a large fine. Therefore, it is essential you handle this information properly. Now, there are four key things that you and your business will need to consider at, at, at its inception. What in external documents do you need? such as a privacy policy? What internal documents do you need, such as a data protection record and a processing record? And depending on the nature of your business, you may also wish to consider a record of consent, a breach register, and data protection provisions within employment contracts. Stakeholder contracts. Think about, are you giving third parties data? Do you have a data processing agreement? Does it need to be a national or internationally compliant? And lastly, you should always register with the ICO. Now, I mentioned very briefly about privacy policies, and this is about the most straightforward thing you can do to get on your way to being compliant with GDPR. A large aspect of the GDPR is about openness. This means that a customer should always know about their data, how it's being handled, what it is collect why it is collected, and what um, what is collected and why it is collected and how it is used. A privacy policy should help communicate this to your customers, especially where products are sold online and data is collected online. A privacy policy should comprehensively outline the above questions for your client to, to fully understand what is happening with their information. And lastly, a privacy policy should outline the steps available to data subjects to lodge a formal complaint in the event of a breach. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have received some questions from makers with regard to GDPR, because of course, as makers, you'll be handling people's data. Um, so the first question um, we've received here is, I would like to start a newsletter. I've been selling for a few years now, but have no mailing list. Can I use my buyer's email addresses to contact them and add them to a newsletter mailing list? Good question. Okay, so the answer is, uh, like the answer to most things, sort of yes and sort of no. Um, so if a concerned individual has already bought one of your products, uh, this signifies that you have received their details in the course of sale. Now, under such circumstances, with reference to Regulation 223A, uh, of the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations, you are entitled to send them a direct email for the purpose of direct marketing. This is what is known as a soft opt-in, 
This situation is encountered where an individual has purchased something from another party and has not expressly opted out of marketing messages. By not doing so, they have indirectly accepted to receive future advertising from you. It is good practice to have an unsubscribe button at the bottom of your email newsletter so that people can easily unsubscribe who do not wish to receive such emails. And it sort of goes back to what I mentioned earlier in the video about internal documentation and making sure you have that record of consent. Uh, so it just makes life so much easier for yourselves if you can easily see who has said yes, who has said no, and you can avoid sending unsolicited communications to people. Yeah, that's a really good point about the unsubscribe button. Definitely look into that. Um, so the second question is, I regularly take part in live events like craft fairs and open studios. Is it still OK to collect people's data, like their name and contact email using a paper form? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, the, the GDPR applies where processing of data is conducted by automated means. So an exception to the use of such means is, ex is accepted when the, the data collector is going to be stored in a filing system. Um, so therefore, data if data is collected via a paper form, um, this is sort of neatly collected and stored, then such process will be accepted under GDPR, even if the directive leans sort of slightly towards more electronical means of collecting. It is still important to know that once you have collected the data, you will still be responsible for it uh, as a data controller uh, and for ensuring that it's, you know, it's, prop it's proper use and safekeeping. Uh, if you were to lose that list of personal data, that would still constitute a data breach. Um, so we would therefore suggest keeping hard copy lists to a minimum, um, you know, name and email address at, at the very most. Um, seek to reach out via electronic means should any other additional information be, be necessary. And then this way, in the event that data is lost, it is kept to an absolute minimum. The risk to data subjects is also kept to a minimum to an extent that any potential claim for a data breach would likely be too small to warrant any actual compensation claim, uh, which is what we refer to as the de minimis threshold. Okay, fab. So I know a lot of makers do find it, um, yeah, that's the easiest way, obviously, to gather people's data at events, and, but really get that onto your computer as soon as possible and get rid of that um, safely. So um, question, the next question is, I would like to send a director of a gallery a copy of my newsletter. Can I do this or do I need their permission to send them my newsletter? Okay, so um, so there's a, re a regulation 22.2 of the privacy and electronic communications regulations. Um, it's, it's, it's unauthorized to send unsolicited communications for the purpose of direct marketing if the recipient has requested, it has not requested the information. So it sort of goes back to, it's, it's just sort of another, another way of asking the first, the first sort of question. Going back to the answer to my, to my first question, Regulation 3B, um, it states that if the other party generates similar products or services, the individual can instigate an unsolicited communication. And consequently, if your newsletter concerns galleries, you would then, I, I would, in our opinion, you would then be permitted to send a copy to the director. So it, it, it really just comes down to are you sending something to someone who is working within the same same thing that you are looking to send them? You're not just coming to them, you know, with um, something that's completely random or has got nothing to do with what it is that they do. Because, uh, you know, we've all received, you know, those annoying pamphlets and leaflets and emails. And, you know, they're, 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 not, they're not needed or wanted. And so we don't want to be contributing towards, towards that. And indeed, there are, there are regulations that say you can't. So it's, it's very quite simple. Just think about what are you sending and is it relevant to the person that you're sending it to? And this way you should be able to avoid sending unsolicited communications. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, so moving on, the next question, would you recommend uh, producing a privacy policy statement to show how I collect and manage people's data? In a nutshell, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, a privacy policy is sort of one of the 
um, sort of basic fundamentals that we would encourage every business to have. Um, so as I sort of touched upon earlier, it just sets out um, what happens with your personal data, you know, what, what your intention is with that data, why you're collecting it, um, what it will be used for, how it will be stored, what happens, what you will do if there is a breach and what a data subject can do, you know, if they need to contact somebody or if there has been a breach. It, it is, it's, a, it's, sort of, it's almost like your one size fits all document um, that sort of gives a complete overview. And it really goes, it really harks back to sort of back to those key principles of GDPR, fairness and transparency. Um, you know, individuals, they, they have the right to be informed about the collection and management of their personal data. And thus, that's exactly what a privacy policy statement can do. In, there, are, there are examples of privacy policy statements available online. However, in our experience, a lot of them are quite poorly drafted. Um, in other words, if they're freely available, they generally haven't been looked over and checked, and they're usually quite muddy in there in the way they've gone about explaining things. Um, I would highly recommend that you speak with solicitors like us uh, who can draft these policies on your behalf. We can make we can draft these policies in a very clear and concise way. Keep it very you know jargon light um so that you know the, the everyday person can read this and understand this not that everybody you know goes onto the website and reads the privacy policy in any way um but the point is that it, it's there um if somebody does want to read it and if you ever do get into any trouble with handling of personal data you can at the very least say well look we had a privacy policy statement and we told you this is what we were going to do with your data and if the, if the person hasn't read it, that's up to them. You, know, you, you don't need to check and make sure that they've read it and agreed it. You put it out there, it's there for them to read. And if they don't want to read, the subject doesn't read it, that's entirely up to them, that's, that's their choice. Um, but yeah, we would highly recommend having, having a privacy policy. Okay, have it, have it there as a backup and don't get it from online. So, <laughs> um... The next question, um, do I need to manage my uh, mailing data through MailChimp or can I just use a list that I have stored in Excel? Okay, so um, there's a, uh, uh, I'm going to test my memory now, I think it's recital 78 of the GDPR, um, talks about how a controller must use the appropriate technical and organisational measures to ensure the protection of personal data. Now, Excel is a system that has incredibly poor data integrity. Um, this signifies that sort of by means of a spreadsheet, information can be entered into any column, even if such a column is not intended to collect any such data. In other words, you can get, you can get data mixed up and all over the place, and it ends up being stored incorrectly. In opposition, MailChimp provides the necessary tools to fulfill GDPR's requirements. It's been specifically made uh, to ensure compliance with GDPR. The platform provides specific forms, setting, setting and contact profiles uh, to ensure compliance um, of the data that is you're storing. Consequently, we would recommend that you use clients like MailChimp rather than Excel to manage your, your mailing data. Okay, that's really interesting because I think the majority of people probably do, well, makers at least, are still using Excel. So um, that's definitely something to think about. Um, and on that note, because we do mainly use Excel, um, does my Excel data list need to be password protected? Um, it, but in law, it doesn't have to be, um, but it's highly recommended that any digital document that you hold that is storing personal data is encrypted. Um, the GDPR requests that all data must remain confidential. Therefore, when you are storing data, it is in, indirectly required to be protected. Now, this protection can be in many sort of forms, but the easiest way is to just put a password on it and only give that password to the people that need to have access to that document. And then in terms of passwords, just very simple, bulk standard safety information on 
password verification, making sure it's you know, more than 10, 12 characters, you know, upper, lowercase, numbers, special characters, capitals, lowercase, et cetera, and so on. Don't use words. Um, um, it's, I think for something like 10 or 12 years in a row, the, the most commonly used password in the world is still uh, ABC123 or, or password or something ridiculous. Um, so oh. <laughs> it's, it is quite, it is quite astonishing. And the problem, the problem is if you pick a very basic password, if that data, if that file does become compromised or whatever, it gets, it finds its way in front of somebody who does not have access or, or authorized access to it. If you've picked one of those highly popular, easy to use passwords, that's the very first thing that most people would do is just basically just try all of those passwords first and see if, if that works. Um, so yeah, make it long, complicated, uni. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's worth, worth doing. Um, <laughs> so very last question. Um, I wish to recruit freelancers and volunteers to support my business. Do I need to password protect any documents that they share, such as CVs? Okay, so it's, it's a similar question to, to the last one. Yeah, I mean, uh, applicants' data qualifies uh, as personal data. I mean, if you think about the information that's on a CV, you've got somebody's name, contact number, um, email address, some, sometimes their home address as well. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot there, um, you know, that, that somebody can, can go away and, and, and start tackling. Um, email addresses are an interesting one because a lot of, a lot of the time, once they, once they get out there, again, it comes back to what are popular passwords that are simple passwords that are used over and over. And most of the time, people who are looking to sort of get gain control of email accounts, that's essentially what they will do first. They will run through all of those simple passwords first, and then they will run through things like initials and dates of birth, because that's still a very popular thing for people to do. And again, that's information that's likely to be on, on, on your CV. So there's, there's a lot of personal data on, on a CV. Um, when, when it comes to storing that information, it's just about just making just very sensible choices. So again, if, if you are printing it out, once you're finished with that hard copy, just make sure it's shredded. Right, you know, it, it or it is put in confidential ways. Um, otherwise, you know, make sure you if, if you're storing them digitally, then have them in a separate folder. You know, make sure it's names, CVs. Make sure that folder is password protected. And then, you know, if you are not interested in a candidate and you you've informed that candidate that they've not been successful and you're not considering looking at them in the future, then do you really need to continue having their CV on file? Uh, and if you don't, then you know just just delete it and, and remove it. Um, just inform inform the data subject that you know that's that's what you that's what you've done. Um, yeah, it's just it's just it's a lot of com a lot of these a lot of GDPR just comes around to thinking about things with a bit of common sense. You know, it, is the information personal? Could I identify somebody from this information? And if so, then you need to look after it. And nine times out of ten, the way to look after it will be to, to password protect it. Make sure it's filed safely make sure you're not mixing documents that hold personal data with you know other random business documents you know try and keep them separated so just about making sure you're organized um and 95 percent that will that will keep you within compliance okay that's a really good tip actually keep organized and keep on top of it and don't yeah. kind of put it to the side um that's brilliant thank you so much Alex that's all of the questions oh, okay. that was really helpful um so before I go just to signpost you to Briffa Legal who you can find online at briffa.com and that's b-r-i-f-f-a um and if you're looking for any business skills support in any other areas of your craft business you can find over 30 free business skills resources including webinars and talks like this one templates downloadable resources um over at the business skills section of the Crafts council website um or you can always contact us directly at makerdev at craftscouncil.org.uk um and that's it so thank you all for joining us and see you next time thank you very much alex Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you.